sad and interesting soundtrack of summer series. I was kind of thinking about it this week. It has not been your relaxed, easy listening playlist. Right? Who's with me? I kind of feel like, you know, when my boys are going to some kind of sports thing, Zach has what he calls his pump it up playlist that has to go on in the car, right? It's got like Eye of the Tiger and We Will Rock You and I don't know, a bunch of other ones that have got that deep bass beat and the drums and we have to play that all the way to whatever the sporting event that we're going to. And that's what I feel like this soundtrack of summer series has been. Oh, it's so good. Neil and Tamara, you're back. Oh, we miss you guys. We're praying for you guys. So nice to have you back. Hey, right, pump it up, pump it up, people. We're back to our Pump It Up series. And, um, you know, I, I love that. But maybe some of you are kind of like, I'm not so sure. Not so sure I'm ready to pump it up for this year, right? Pastor Darren told us last week, you're in the fight, whether you like it or not. You're in the middle of it, right? Sometimes I think this life, we could call it the game of life. Right, We're in the game of life, whether we choose to be or not, life is going to continue around us. And so the question is, let's like, are we in it? Are we actually in it? Are you pumped up for life this year? Julie is. Awesome. And there was more than one. So that's exciting. But maybe you kind of, I don't know, Pastor Mel, kind of just not quite sure if I'm there yet. That's okay because by the end of this message, you will be. Amen. Hey, the good news is that God never calls us into a battle that he hasn't actually equipped us to win, right? You need to remember that. And so I am thinking this message, it's like the pregame team huddle, okay? So we've had, we've had the training, we've had the strategy. This is now right on the border, pregame team huddle. We're all in together and God is actually going to release like a practical strategy for us today because we need something to go home with and actually do, okay? So that's where we're going today. Now, if you're writing, no, no not if, in your notes, why don't you write or type at the top online in your notes, playing to win, the title of the sermon today, Playing to Win. If we are playing this game, then let's play it to win, right? And more so just individually, let's all, we're a team. We're all playing to win together. I firmly believe that we're not individuals kind of doing our life and every now and then touching base on a Sunday. If you're in this house, you're on this team, Right, Pastor Nate just spoke about that. What are you bringing to the team? You're on this team. We're in this together. The Bible tells us that we are actually so connected that he sees us like a body. And no part of the body can like just decide not to function without the entire body not working properly. Right, that's how connected we are. And every one of us has got to play the game and play it to win. Now, I have some nice sports stories today, which I know will make Pastor Nate happy. (laughs) But that's because God literally dropped this message while I am watching a futsal game. That is where I spend a lot of my time, is watching various sporting games. But we recently uh, were in Sydney and watching my boys play futsal in the nationals competition. Now, does anybody know what futsal is? A few? Usually I describe it to people as like indoor soccer, but I have decided that that is a very poor description because futsal is like soccer on steroids, okay? It is a super intense game, which my son Zach finds very funny because he knows how much I hate. Like, I love my kids, but I hate watching them lose. Like, it kills me. And I hate when the games are, like, super close and it just doesn't fill me with joy. But 
Soccer, like futsal, like you play it on a basketball court size field and there's five on a side and there's like no time to rest. You are attacking up that end in one minute and then you are running back to the other end and defending like within two seconds. I have learnt the important lesson that you do not stand as a spectator on either end of the courts because when they kick that ball, which is like harder than a soccer ball, it flies at an incredible rate. I have seen iPhones smashed. I have seen glasses hit. I have seen little kids taken out. So there are really important lessons that I have learnt as a futsal mum. Like, as a spectator, you're on. You are always looking for that ball to come flying your way, which the kids think is funny. But anyway, there is a point to this story. As I was watching these futsal games, and Zach's team was pretty good this year, so we're in some pretty intense games, right? We've got to win these games. And the pressure comes on. And I notice something about players in the team when the pressure is on, particularly when they're one goal down, which in futsal is like the worst ever, right? There's something that happens. And yep, it was my son, Zach, but it was also one of his other teammates. There was something about the two of them that when the pressure came on, right, they had this never say die attitude, resolve. They were so positive. They're like the first ones attacking. They're the first ones calling their team back in defence. They're like so positive. They're pumped up. We're going to win this. Come on, team. And I'll tell you what, as a spectator, like just sitting on the side, it was so encouraging. I'm like, yeah, we are going to win this. Come on. If they're like that, anything is possible. I can't even imagine what that was like for their teammates to have that on their team. These players, they were literally game changers. And as I'm sitting there and I'm watching that game, God talks to me and he goes, you know what? That game that you're watching is like the game of life. And that team, Zach's team, because of course it's our team, that are, they're the believers. They're the good guys. And the opposition team, which is Sydney. Sorry, I do know we have visitors from Sydney. We love you. We're so happy to have you in the house. You've actually moved to the best place. Um, anyway, there's, there is a rivalry against Sydney, and Sydney are a little dirty players. I hate to tell you that. There's, so there's fierce rivalry against the Sydney team. But anyway, they're the opposition. That's Satan. <laughs> and his crew. <laughs> All right, stick with me in the story. You can write any emails to Pastor Nate afterwards. He'll answer them for you. Anyway, this is the game of life, right? I'm watching. And God says to me, you get to choose how you play this game of life. You get to choose whether you are those game changers. Are you the positive ones on the court? Always got your eyes on the big picture. Always calling your teammates up and saying, come on, we can do this. Like never, ever stopping believing. Or are you the players out there with their heads down, tired, defeated, getting so hung up on the referee calls, the ones that didn't happen, getting so stuck in those missed opportunities. Yes, they're so frustrating, but I watch players get stuck in that space of, if only that goal had gone in, my entire life would have looked different. Well, they weren't thinking that, but like the entire game, right? And I see players in the game of life going, if only that had happened or that hadn't happened, everything would be different. Can you see that picture in your head? And as I'm watching this play out and I'm watching my son's team, for those who don't know, Zach's my son. He's awesome. He's in the youth row now. (laughs) As I'm watching this game right play out, I wanted to be on the winning team, but more than that, I wanted to be that player on the team. You know, I want to give you a couple of scriptures in case you're sitting there going, well, I don't really feel like that player. Why don't you have a look at Romans 8, 37. God says to us, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
In John 16, 33, it says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Can I tell you, I had like about another five scriptures, but in the essence of time, I had to cut them. But you can go through the Bible and you can find so many, so many things about how the fact is that God has won the battle and we are winners. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you are a winner. Could you, hang on, hang on, hang on. We're going to do it again and we're going to say it with some enthusiasm. You're a winner. Yes, come on. You are a winner, church. The truth is. All right, that's lovely. Now you can look back here. The truth is, church, that the game of life is a high-pressure, high-stakes game, but the game is actually not in doubt. The game has already been won by God. You are on the winning team when you are a believer, and the game is to actually play out life as a winner, right? We're playing to win, church. Great, Mel. I have no idea what to do with that tomorrow. I'm going to tell you. The question is, how do we actually play like it? Like, how do we play to win? Because I'm not naive. Stuff happens. And you know what? Stuff happens in the futsal game. It's not like these players are like robots, completely devoid of feeling. They took the hits. There was disappointment. But it doesn't mean that we can't play to win. All right, so how do we play to win? Super simple answer. And it's in the entire book of Psalms. Praise. Did you pick that up from all the songs this morning? (laughs) Praise. I want you to write this down. Point one. Praise is our secret source. Hey, do you like that? Aren't our AV team cool? Did you write down source as in tomato sauce? Because now you get to cross it out and write down source. I thought that was pretty nifty, and you will now remember that point this week. Awesome. All right, let's have a look. A secret source, S-A-U-C-E, is a special quality or feature regarded as the chief factor in the success of something or someone. Now, as I'm watching this futsal game, I've got to let you in on a secret play they had, which drove me nuts. They call it the goalie run. Right? It's when the goalie comes out and runs up into the attacking half so that in that space they have an extra player to attack with, which sounds awesome, except if you lose the ball because then the goalie has to make it back in front of the like, goals, otherwise the other team gets this like, easy play. And so they kept doing it. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But it was their cool secret play. They were pretty proud of it. You know, and a secret play is awesome. Oh, but sometimes I think we spend a lot of time looking for the secret plays of life. What's that latest revelation from the Insta Real Preacher that's going to change my life today? Ooh, listen to the front row. <laughs> we spend a lot of time looking for that secret little thing that's going to completely change my life. But what we actually need is a quality or a feature as believers that helps us win every time, right? And Psalms tells us that praise, follow me here, praise is the secret source because it connects us to the power source, S-O-U-R-C-E. All right, we're writing this down. Praise is your secret source that connects you to the source of power. It's how you win every time. No matter what the ref call is, no matter what the near miss is, no matter what happens in life, He is your source of power. He is how you win. Okay, we're going to actually read a psalm. It took me a long time to find a psalm, to be honest, because every psalm, talks about this. And I was just going to read you Psalms 1 to 150. But I chose not to. Instead, I had to settle with just five verses of a psalm because I feel like it expresses so much what we are trying to say today, okay? Or what God is trying to say. So Psalm 34. Why don't you open that up? We're going to start right at the top of it because it makes this declaration about praise. Psalm 34, 1 to 5. 
I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak of his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all, all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy and no shadow of shame will darken their faces. What an awesome five verses in the Bible that describes who God is and therefore who we are as players on his winning team. Like that little five verses there is like got a winning coach. It's got a winning game plan. It's got winning players who, you know, it doesn't deny the fact that there are fears and that there are troubles and that there's a battle to play. It's not glossing over that. It's not being fake, hyped up. You know, we're not like these people that just are like, praise the Lord. Where we just say it like devoid of feeling, that's not the point. The point is there is something deeper in these players that enables them to say a genuine praise the Lord, no matter what is actually happening in the game of life, right? And life looks different for us when we live in praise. I am convinced that as believers, we should be the most joyful people on planet earth. Can I be honest? Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we actually get so stuck in our pain in some kind of good thought of, oh, well, we're actually really dealing with all the stuff in our heart. And so therefore we have to remain in this place of solemn lament before God because otherwise that's not being our in- authentic. We're being inauthentic, right? I feel like we get sometimes this mindset. That's not who we are. Come on, we are people who should be the most joyful, positive, confident people on the planet. We should be a lot of fun to be around. Like people should hang out with us and they should be like, man, what is it about that person? I want to be on your team. How do I get on your team? That's actually who we're meant to be. And it's way more fun to be that person. Right? I was talking to Julie before she shared with us an amazing testimony this morning about healing, which is great, Julie. And she's so supercharged on praise today. Like, you go and hang out with Julie afterwards. But the thing about Julie is Julie's always like this. Julie was like this before she had the breakthrough. Julie's like this after the breakthrough. Julie is just a person of praise. Love it about you, Julie. We should all be like that. Be like Julie. That can be on your catch fry. Be like Julie. All right, okay, okay. But how do we actually do that? So youth, here's what you need to do this week. You're listening? And young adults, you're going to walk into university. You're going to jump up on those, like, bench seats and you're going to start breaking out into song. Praise the Lord for his glorious day and all the amazing things that's going to happen at school this week. Right? Only Josie is excited. (laughs) Don't be weird. You'll be pleased to know that life is not a musical. Sorry, Margie. (laughs) My daughter Esther would love if life was a musical, right? No, I am not saying that life is a musical and you need to break out in song in the middle of your office so that you can be a people who is praising God. Okay, so you can strike that one off your list. Neither am I saying, Tamika, that we need to go and find the harps and the ten-string lyres and the timbrels and all the things, because I feel like in this modern, you know, expression of worship, we've lost the authentic nature that King David had, and we feel like we need to re-explore that in praise. Who's up for it? Pastor Nate's pumped. (laughs) No! Praise is not like some style of music. We see different praise expressions in the Bible. And yes, King David did sing with ten string lyres. And I had to look up how to say a liar. Leah, liar. It's a liar. Um, They did express praise like that. But praise, and we express it with like basses and drums and awesome, right? And the church has got really hung up on praise as being a style of music. Praise is not a style of music either. 
In fact, this whole psalm, if you read the whole Psalm 34, talks about praising God. It doesn't actually talk about singing. One little bit. Because praise, in its very simple definition, is honouring God for who He is and what He has done. And it is actually something that should come out of every single part of our lives. It's not restricted to two first songs on a Sunday. Right, let's look at verse 1. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak of His praises. Do you know what practically praise is? It's being a really joyful person. Right, And that should actually naturally come out in our conversations with people. Praising God and the things that He's done for us and who He is should naturally roll off our tongue as a part of who we are in the spaces of life that we find ourselves. Right, And God has definitely been speaking to me about this one. Because here's a repentance, I don't know, confession, that's what I'm looking for. I can hide behind my personality of like glass half empty girl and say, well, that's just the way God made me because, you know, I'm the person who finds the problems to fix them. I've done that a lot. My husband will attest to that. He used to really annoy me because he's always so optimistic. And I used to just put that down to a personality difference between us. He's the man of faith like anything can happen. I'm the one that brings reality to our marriage. There is a time and a space for reality. But do you know what? Praise is not a personality, peoples. Praise is not just for the extroverts among us or the glass half full people. I need to be a person of praise. I need to override my personality and praise the Lord regardless of what I'm seeing in front of me. It's like an attitude. It's a perspective. It's the way I'm interpreting life and the way that I'm walking through life. I'm way off my notes. That's awesome. Be joyful, praise, practically, just be joyful. Just be that person who is joyful about God and life and everything that we get to walk into. Verses two to three, I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt His name together. Do you know what praise practically is? It's being God-focused, not self-focused. Praise puts our thoughts in the right place, right? Our God, here's the truth, doesn't change. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is always present. He doesn't change. He is eternal. He has existed since the beginning of time. He will exist right to the end. You know, I was reading in, I think it's Psalm 34. He like gathers the seas into jars. Just let that sit in your head for a moment. I can't even fathom the seas being small enough that it would fit into a jar. Yet when God looks over the oceans of our world, that's what He sees. Like, that's how big He is. You see, when we become self-focused, our problems get bigger and God gets smaller. That's just, that's a truth. But if we stay focused on God and how big He is, then even when we are walking through like the shadow of the valley of death, even when we are there, we are able to see like this table that He set before us in the presence of our enemies. We are able to see that God is good and God won't change. We are able to know that God is love. And that won't change. And that God loves you. And if you are here like Pastor Simo preached week one, He has prepared you to be there. You have everything that you need in that moment to win. He hasn't shoved you out there and left you on your own and just sat up there and gone, oh, let's see what happens. God is not that kind of God. God is a God who is incredibly present and active in your world. And if we stop and we put our perspective on Him and we praise Him and we boast of Him, it tells our soul something. It's like, wake up, soul. Wake up and see what the Lord has done. It's really healthy for us to stay in a space of reverent and awesome fear of God. Don't let God become so over familiar that He becomes small. Okay, verse four to five, I prayed to the Lord and He answered me. Awesome. Those who look to Him for help will be what? 
will just make it through, will like struggle along until they get to the end of time and go to heaven. No, the Bible verse says they're gonna be radiant with joy, right? No shadow of shame will darken their faces. There is so much glorious truth in this, right? Praise is practically depending on God because you have a real relationship with Him. Did you know that praise is a gift? God doesn't need our praise. God is completely self-existent. He's completely self-sustaining. He's got this incredible relationship thing happening. Trinity, God, Son, Holy Spirit, like they're awesome. He doesn't actually need our praise to feel good about Himself. But God gave us this gift of praise. Why? Because it's actually how we enjoy God. It's a relational thing. He delights in our praises. We praise Him, we praise Him. He delights in our praises. If you don't know God, try praising Him. Like just try start talking out the things about Him. If you don't know it, go to your Bible, pick up some Psalms and just start reading them out to God. Because when we praise Him, it puts us in a relational space with Him and we get to hear His voice and we get to know Him. Right? Praise is this incredible relational thing that God has given us. We should use it. We should use it all the time. It's a gift. Open it. Live in it. Love it. It's better than any gift that anybody could give you. Amen? I'm convinced, church, that God is telling, reminding, imploring, going, come on, church, remember this. Expand praise into every facet of your life, not just the songs you play in your car trip on the way to work, not just the first two songs on a Sunday, right? Not just when life looks good, but as this underlying source that everything else springs out of because that is how we play to win every single time. That was point one. <laughs> That's the foundation that we live from, right? That's the foundation. But I said to Julie today, I'm like, Julie, you got supercharged for praise, right? I, I wanna live in a space of like supercharged winning, and I think we can. I think the Bible tells us that we can actually supercharge our praise. So point two, praise is our weapon. I want you to say it with me with some gumption. Ready? Praise is our weapon. Oh, I guarantee you by the end of this sermon, you're gonna be saying that like Braveheart did. You know the movie Braveheart? When he's out the front of his team and they're like gonna go take on the Scottish highlight, like whatever. Sorry, I should have paid attention when I went to Scotland. <laughs> I can't watch that movie anymore. It's too like gut-wrenching for me, but I have seen it. You know, he's got the blue and white stripe and he's like, come on, let's go. Praise is our weapon. We should be like walking around going, yeah, I've got praise in my back pocket. <laughs> I can pull it out anytime I need it. And there's this little story in the Bible that I wanna share with you because it really gets to me because it really annoys me <laughs> because I can't hide from it. It describes who we are. So I want you to turn to Acts 16. And in this little story, we got Paul. Who loves Paul? I love Paul, but golly gosh, Paul is phenomenal. Sometimes it's hard, but Paul reminds us, he's that game-changing player who's out the front saying, come on, this is actually who you are, church. When you read this in the Bible, this wasn't just for me like thousands of years ago. This is who you are right now. And we pick up this story and, you know, Paul and Silas, they're just walking along and they do a good thing. They cast a demon out of a girl, except that the owners are really mad because now they don't have this source of income. And so they haul Paul and Silas before the magistrates and the court and like this big angry mob. And we're gonna pick it up from verse 22, Acts 16, 22 to 25. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is a bad day. Right? Bad day for Paul and Silas. 
And the thing is, I think, you know, they did the most beautiful play, right? That ball got passed straight into the goal. It was gorgeous. It's a really good play. But then that dirty player on the unnamed team, that dirty player fakes an injury, right? And the ref falls for it. It's so frustrating. The ref falls for it and they give him a red card, right? That's the story that we're in the middle of. And this story gets to me because I know what I would do in this moment. I would totally be sulking. I would retreat and I would be totally justified in my head for doing it. Well, God, I just need some space. I'll come back with faith tomorrow. Or maybe next week, maybe next year. Because I was doing all this stuff for you and look what happened. That's not what a game-changing player does. They keep their head up high and they do the exact opposite. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were, you gotta read this bit with me. Paul and Silas were what? Wow, that really petered out. Praying and singing hymns to God, what? Come on, Paul, seriously. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Man, can't I just be grumpy and angry for a moment? But the truth is, if we are actually playing the game of life to win, this is the exact time that we supercharge our praise. I am actually convinced that we get praise and faith around the wrong way. Okay, here's what we do. Something happens in life and we think, God, I just need to retreat for a moment and get my faith back and then I will praise the Lord. No. Do you know what we do? We praise the Lord and then it activates our faith and we get our faith back, right? We got to praise first. Faith comes out of that praise. Faith is like when we've got our eyes fixed on God, suddenly we remember, hang on, it doesn't matter. God's got an awesome plan in this. I just need to follow Him into wherever He is leading me because He's got this. Right, praise fixes our perspective on God. And then we can see in this story, like God did an amazing miracle, frees them out of jail, saves the whole like jailer's family. It's awesome. And we have this whole book of Psalms that implores us to praise God because God knows the power of praise to change atmospheres, to change situations, to wake up our souls and tell it to get on board in the game of life and play to win. I am convinced of this, right? And there is no point in having a weapon in your arsenal if you are not going to pull it out in the critical moments of the game. Church, right now, we got praise, but we got to pull it out. We've got to live life with this entire attitude and this entire perspective of praise. And here's a really awesome, like, side effect. It really annoys the opposition. I loved watching that unnamed team when Zach and his teammate were like all positive. Oh, I loved it because they got so frustrated. They started doing stupid things because they were so frustrated that this team wouldn't say die. That's what happens to the opposition when you praise. Satan gets so frustrated that you won't just roll over and stop honouring God, right? And I've got to just come against this lie from the world. You are actually being your most authentic self when you praise the Lord. Because you know who your most authentic self is? It is somebody who has been saved by the blood of Jesus and actually stands as a new creation. Oh, is somebody who stands as a new creation in God. Do not let the world tell you that to be authentic, you have to sit in your pain and stay there. That is not true. To be your most authentic self, you look up to the God who tells you who you are and you allow the Holy Spirit to heal those parts of your lives, not because you try really hard, but because He wants to. And He has the power to transform you. It's so good to play to win. So good. I want you to look around church, like not just the people sitting next to you because you probably know them. Like actually, I'm telling you to, like look behind you. Look to the left, look to the right, look in front. This is our team. We're in this together. You are not alone. 
right? And when we praise together as a whole team, when all of us live a life in this attitude of praise and we all come in here together, we don't have just one or two game changers on our team. We have an entire team of game changers. Come on, that is actually who we are, church. I want you to stand up. And I'm going to read to you the words that you actually praised this morning. And there's such a declaration. The song we sang this morning said, we said we'd do this. We'd praise in the valley. We'd praise on the mountain. We'd praise when we're sure. We'd praise when we're doubting. We'd praise when we feel it. And we praise when we don't. We praise why? Because He is sovereign. He reigns. He rose. He defeated the grave. He's faithful. He's true. Because there is nobody greater than you, God. That's what we declared this morning. And now listen, it's like all in the song. It's awesome. Because my praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. Do you have a Jericho in your life right now? You don't need more faith. God says if you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, you can see a mountain get moved into the sea. You don't need to go and find more faith. You've got to praise. You've got to praise the Lord. It's not a cliche thing. Praise the Lord. Like you've got to look up to Him and go, God, This is my Jericho, but you brought a Jericho down with praises. You can bring this Jericho down right now, Lord God. Come on, there is momentum. There's such a momentum, church. When we got a team that plays like that, all of us, when all of us are on the team. I can't stress that enough. This is a message for all of us. You are so needed on this team. You're a game changer on this team. 